This is the best way to play Wrecking Ball. You have three main playstyles, to dive, duel or disrupt. You'll be diving enemies if you have dive heroes like Tracer on your team, and there's a mobile heroes like Zen on the enemy team. You'll be dueling as well for key areas on the map, using your techs to give you the edge. And lastly, you'll be disrupting the enemy team by capitalising on opportunities where enemies are rotating, repositioning, or when you just can't dive or duel. Wrecking Ball's weapon, Machine Gun Kelly, makes ball tears automatic assault cannons apart at 1500 rpm with each shot dealing 5 damage alongside an ammo capacity of 80 rounds. The first thing to mention is ball's reload animation cancel as Yitala explains here. Technically, you reload in crab mode after 0.95 seconds, but you can't shoot until the animation finishes at 2 seconds. In other words, if you want to maximize your damage per second, you can do one of the two things. 1. Melee or 2 quick grapple into fireball. Secondly, similar to D.Va, you can use your quad cannons to spy check for Sombras once the enemy team are setting up. Way back in the day, this is what Chengdu hunters had done against the NYXL on Nambani first point defense. The hunters also appear to be completely ready for the Sombra counterpick, as their composition is well suited to disrupt her. Wrecking Ball and Zarya both have lots of ammo for spraying and spy checking. Spy checking Sombra can disrupt the rotation and buy your team an extra 10 to 15 seconds off the clock. Lastly, let's talk about trigger discipline. This is simply taking the time to readjust your aim with melee when shooting a target in close range, as Yitil explains here. First, try and track as many shots as possible on the enemy, and when you're about to miss, hit him with a left hook. While this is happening, use the time locked in melee animation to adjust your aim. This single tip is so vital with regards to the dueling playstyle and making sure you win those out. So please, take the extra half a second to just track your target and readjust your aim with melee. Wrecking Ball's first ability, Lucio's beat on cooldown, provides Ball a minimum of 100 temporary shields, granting 100 additional shields per enemy within the 10 meter radius. The shields last 9 seconds, with a total cooldown of 15 seconds. Let's talk about using your shields early against CC or stuns. Remember we talked about how, I think this is the last VOD we did of you and Eichenwald, whether you have to kind of read the situation and decide whether you need to pop your shields early with the anticipation of CC burst. Well, yeah, they're running Hawk, but they're running Doomfist, who's dead, and Tracer. None of those are going to really burst you down instantaneously. I would not be afraid of waiting to pop adaptive shields when you need to. Because if anything, if Hawk hooks you and pulls you in towards his team, you'll get a better adaptive shield there, and they don't have the damage to be able to burst you down. This adaptive shield, completely unnecessary. Now, let's be real. There's not much CC in Overwatch 2 compared to Overwatch 1, so you don't really need to worry about popping your shields early before being stunned. But if you're about to dive in Ana and can get decent shields out of it, still use your shields because the last thing you want is to die because you are too greedy. Aside from that, it's really important you don't overuse your adaptive shields. Keep in mind that you don't have to use adaptive shields every single time you engage. Ball players too often use adaptive shields when escaping shortly after using pile drive, which is a waste and increases your downtime by 15 seconds if you're just using your shields for the sake of it. Wrecking Ball's second ability, Batman's Grappling Hook, makes Ball launch a grappling claw, allowing him to anchor to an area and swing from it, gaining immense speed. Your grapple will automatically detach after 6 seconds. I'll also couple in your ball form, which basically makes you move at double your normal speed. When ball has reached at least triple your normal speed whilst in grapple, he'll enter a fireball mode, which deals 50 damage to any opponent who touches him, lasting 1.5 seconds. The maximum range for the claw is 23 meters, with a cooldown of 5 seconds. The first thing to mention is that you can do some third person scouting whilst in ball form. Here's an example on Oasis Gardens, where you can hide behind the corner and see any enemies coming towards you. Now onto the tech. I obviously can't include every single piece, but I will include the fundamentals. Firstly, you can b-hop whilst in fireball modes. This is done by jumping every time you hit the ground, helping you to maintain more of your momentum over time. Secondly, you can immediately stop your momentum by exiting your ball modes. This is just done to prevent you from mauling off the map, or for you to start shooting ASAP. Thirdly, you can still perform the double boop, as the streamer ball explains here. To perform the double boop, start with a long grapple ahead of their position. Roll into them with fireball and boop them once. Tap S or down immediately to slow down enough to lose the fireball and then press W or forward to ignite your fireball again. For some reason, people think that you can't do this in Overwatch 2, but you still can, as shown in the background. Fourthly, learn the quick fireball. Quick fireball. Whether it be for speed or for damage, every baller has to get the basics right. 
Learn and master the timing and distance needed for fireball startup so that you can maximize your cooldown usage and end up with less awkward interactions where you're just smacking your ball against people. Fifthly, you can perform a wall jump and pole drive against slanted or flat surfaces as Ethel explains here. One, movement input towards the wall. Two, release movement input as you're about to touch the wall. Three, use the opposite movement input and jump. If you practice this enough, you can pull it off fairly consistently on walls you're familiar with. Next, learn what Yeetle called the Toronto Kick. Simply roll back, jump, grapple above you, and pole drive. Pretty easy, right? This does use all your movement cooldowns at once, so only use it if you need the pole drive damage. Here's another gimmicky name tech that I called the London Leg in my 2020 ball guides. Just grapple into the wall at high speed, then fling in the opposite direction as soon as you come into contact. This should give you enough height for a pole driver, then you can do whatever. Lastly, the 180 degree rebounds. Yet again, here's Ball explaining it. The 180 rebound tech is used to boop enemies without giving them a chance to react to your change in direction. It can be either used to boop them off the map or to boop them into your ultimate like so. To do this, step 1 is to grapple anywhere as long as it's not super high, unless you might start swinging. You want to be on the ground the entire time. Step 2 is to press W or forward into the wall. From here, there are two ways to do step 3. The first way is just before you hit the wall, you let go of W. Then the moment you hit the wall, you need to 180 turn and press W again. Once you're moving again, you can detach the grapple just before you get fireball. The second way is just to press S or backwards when you hit the wall without the camera turn. This is good for people with low sensitivities or who play on console. Once again, detach when you're just about to fireball or else you'll spring right back. One of my favourite things to do is bait enemy Lucios or Balls near the edge and just hold down my power drive button. That means I can't get booped off the moment they boot me. Then immediately I'll 180 rebound them off a nearby wall and uh, hit them with the Uno reverse card. Ball's third ability, how to feed in 3 seconds, <coughs> makes Ball slam into the ground, dealing up to 100 damage in an 8 meter radius, launching the enemy in a locked vertical stance for half a second. Just like a grapple, there's a bunch of tech we need to cover. Firstly, the recovery pole driver. You can perform this by rolling off a ledge, quickly moving back, and pole driving. This is not only used to get you back to high grounds, but you can quickly pop this in a duel, and if you're fighting a squishy, you'll almost certainly win. The extra damage and CC lock-in should be enough to seal the deal, so learning this is absolutely vital for the dueling playstyle. There's obviously the minefield and pole driver combo, which is as old as time. You minefield in the air, then pole drive to suck in enemies towards your minefield, and also deal some damage too. You're basically guaranteed a kill on a squishy just by doing this. Now onto the most important parts, knowing when to not use pole driver and viewing it as a more opportunistic ability as amateur coach Lucid explains here. You want to think of pile drive as a more opportunistic ability. You want to use pile drive when you see these three scenarios. You either want to use it to finish off low HP enemies, relieve pressure from your backline if the enemy's posing a serious threat to it, or when you know someone can follow up on it, like for example a Tracer, an Echo, a Genji. I would add a fourth usage, which is just pole driving when you can get away with it, and or in duels, as discussed prior. That clip from Lucid was from Overwatch 1, when there were a lot more stuns compared to Overwatch 2, but the principle still applies. You don't want to use pole driver and unnecessarily risk your HP pull for it. Kim Jong Un's second favourite weapon makes board deploy a set of long lasting proximity mines which deal 130 damage per mine, lasting 20 seconds. Also note that each mine has 50 HP. There's four main uses to your mines. Firstly, to split the enemy team. Think of it like Dragon Strike and dividing and conquering from there on. Secondly, AoE fragging. A brawl team clumped up together would be a perfect time to minefield for a high chance of dealing serious damage. Thirdly, a solo ult. If you need to force trans or resources away from the front line, it is almost always worth solo minefielding. Lastly, contesting points. There have been many times, especially on Koth and now on Push, where the enemy team will play extremely sloppy and combined with you spinning around the points, a minefield can buy some serious time. Note that some of these points are not mutually exclusive to each other. The last point I want to raise is timing your minefield. As with any offensively used ultimate, it needs to be well timed to receive value. Many ball players, even in the high ranks, will constantly mistime their engagements. Perfectly timed. Good mines too. It doesn't need to get kills to be good. They're trying to go in and find value with this mine engage. They've committed to this fight. You go for like a boop play. You don't quite get it good enough. You preemptively 
Adaptive shield, which is good because the Kree hog, which is good. You mine, which is good. And then you get out of town. You've done your job. Like there's somebody on point right now. That person is by themselves. They're so split right now. Your team can follow up on all of this. Your Genji can follow up on all of this. Now onto the playstyle and positioning part of the guides. For those who've watched my old ball guides, these three playstyles do remain the same, but with a few tweaks. I'll let Spyro cover the three main playstyles, being the dive, disrupt, or duel, and then I'll add my own nuance. It's dive, duel, disrupt. You kind of break down the disrupt into like point pressure, boom, okay? Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? And obviously that's going to change depending on the status of your cooldowns as well. Like you're less likely to be able to dive or duel if you're down your adaptive shields, right? In addition, a lot of your dives were mistimed. This was a consistent theme. And actually your boop pressure was mistimed as well. So whether it was Genji and Spawn, whether it was you diving onto their Sigma instead of their Ana before they even push through, um, whether it was you rolling through them before they are even through the choke, you're usually too early. Like you wanna be like the fight is started now and you display their positioning the enemy tanks have committed to the fight then you dive their honor and that that screws them up because now they're already in a position to where they don't want to go and deal with what the heck's going on back there they're looking this way there's people shooting them in the face and if you're going in first and they just shoot you and they clear you out and then they use their cooldowns on your team while you're going to get a mega health back that's a 5v6 and you fed ult charge as well as you know obviously don't go for your boop role plays if half of your team isn't even there or a member of your team isn't there to follow up on it and if they're not in a position to get boot. So with Overwatch 2, the main difference will be that you're dueling a lot more. I had a talk with some coaches I respect and because there's no other tank in Overwatch 2, the bad news is that you'll have to cover more angles. The good news is that you're the most mobile tank in the game so you can get anywhere at any time, even Yeetil said that in his own guides. So for example, say you're attacking them by any second points. You're playing against Honor, Mercy, Ash, Soldier. Maybe the Soldier, Ash, and Mercy are on high grounds. Ideally, if possible, you could duel the enemy Ash or Soldier, doing those recovery pole drivers we talked about earlier. If there's too much healing and you can't duel, no biggie. Go for the disrupt playstyle instead, looking to conserve your HP pool, doing roll throughs, and avoiding pole drivers. The goal with disruption here is to get the soldier and Ash to spend as much time looking at you rather than your team, whereas with diving or dueling, your main goal is lethality. If you of course have a Genji or someone to help you, then you could dive the Ash or soldier, but that won't always be the case. I hope this example helps to illustrate how you can fluctuate between the three playstyles at a moment's notice. Finally, I do want to cover playing up against compositions with high CC. Overwatch 2 obviously has a lot less CC and stuns compared to Overwatch 1, but if you are playing against a composition like a Hog, Mei, Sombra, Ana, or any future heroes down the line, perhaps it's worth noting that you should likely lean into the disruption playstyle, generally avoiding pole drivers unless you have solid follow-up. Speaking of Sombra, what happens if you flank and she hacks you out of invis? Well, you have two options dealing with Sombra. The first is to take shorter flanks and to flank later into the team fights. For example, on Rialto second point defense, you start up by the stairs, and then when the enemy backline walk through the choke, you go for a pole driver, roll through, etc. A short, well-timed flank. Your second option is that you can still go for flanks as you normally would, but you need a tracer or another hero to come with you. Simple solution, but requires some coordination. Now onto the tank matchups. Just like with my D.Va guide, I'd like to group up some of the tanks into the Pokeball hybrid matchup featuring Sigma, Hog, Reinhardt, Ramatra, Orisa, Junker Queen and Zarya, and into the dive matchups featuring D.Va, Winston and Doomfist, since your playstyle against these heroes are very similar. Starting off with the Poke Brawl tanks. Notice how your mobility against each of these tanks is significantly higher. Abuse that. Look to fight for space and angles around the tanks rather than fighting the tanks themselves. Obviously, against the and Hog, you'll definitely want to be opportunistic with your pole driver to avoid being stunned, but here, you'll rarely be fighting them. If the enemy backline are squishy heroes, like Zen or Mercy, you'd be diving or drawing them, but if they're more slippery, like a Kiriko or Lucio, you'll be disrupting most of the time. The Dive Tanks this is a bit more complicated. Doomfist just has too much mobility, so you'll just be trading or diving each other's backlines for the most part. With Winston, you can disrupt his dive by booping him out of his bubble, or again by diving the Winston's own backline. Against D.Va, your playstyle will actually be more like the Poke Brawl tanks, because D.Va can peel, unlike Doomfist or Winston. If you dive the backline, D.Va's gonna be there to peel that off. If you duel enemy DPS, D.Va's gonna be there. So it all comes down to what the enemy team are running. Well that's it for the guides. If you enjoyed, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe, and if this video helped to raise your IQ, don't forget to share it with your friends to also raise theirs. Until next time.